and welcome to Note Doctors. My name is Paul. My name is Jen. My name is Ben. And we are your hosts. We are all university music theory instructors who are passionate about music theory and music theory instruction. In this podcast, we will be talking about all things theory with some of the best music theory teachers in the country. If you want to know more about music theory and the most effective and innovative ways to teach it, this is the podcast for you. So today on our podcast, we have a very special guest, Dr. Jennifer Snodgrass, who we are so excited to have. Jen, tell us a little bit about Dr. Snodgrass. So Jenny Snodgrass is a professor of music theory at Appalachian State University. She has written a textbook called Contemporary Musicianship that is a phenomenal resource, especially for people that are teaching Uh, music business or music industry students. It really is a book to connect with them. And she has just put out a book called Teaching Music Theory, New Voices and Approaches that uh, documents her travels around the United States, observing music theory teachers of all kinds, including high school, college, at private schools, community colleges, all sorts of places. And um, it's also, and it's, I think, going to be the new music theory pedagogy textbook. So we are excited for you to uh, hear our conversation with Jenny. She's a delightful person, and there's definitely a lot to learn. And so for the next week, I'm going to take the time and go and listen to all of your music and do whatever I can to integrate it into this classroom at some point. It means so much to these students that some have just been told what to listen to or what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And for you to go, you know, your thoughts and your interests matter here too. Um, I think that really sets the tone that there's a respect between both of us um, and students just really, really live with that. You respected me and you wanted to hear what I had to say. So when you start getting into the point where you want them to be independent thinkers and you want them to share their opinions, they feel safe doing that in your class. If you start that message from the very first day, like you matter. All right, so we are so excited uh, for you, Jenny, to be on our podcast. Um, before we get into you know theory teaching and talking about your book, um, we thought we would ask you a little bit about your background and kind of how you ended up being a music theory professor. I mean, what you know, what series of unfortunate events or perhaps fortunate <laughs> events you know led you to this profession? Well, I I actually started as an opera singer. So when I was seven years old, I checked out the Beverly Sills album of La Traviata from my local library. My parents were folk singers and were like, why are you checking that out? So, um, but I fell in love with opera and at the age of nine, um, I actually auditioned for the Virginia opera and became like a touring child. So I didn't really have a normal childhood from about ages nine to 13, I'd say, cause I was on a bus. And um, I was always like the street urchin or the little kid that came up and stole the flowers in La Boheme or something like that. But um, I was on a bus with Renee Fleming before she even had her med audition. So um, that's how I fell in love with music. And I remember one time um, I was in Carmen and, um, you know, had dirt all over my face because I was uh, playing one of the street people and just listening to the final aria and being like, this is what I wanted to do. So. I went off to college to study vocal performance and it was wonderful. And I um, was up at uh, in New York having a voice lesson one day and the teacher up there said, go home and have your cords scoped, which is absolutely the most horrifying that thing that a uh, vocalist can hear. So I went home to my college and sure enough, I had you know pre-nodules and, and all sorts of issues on my cords. And so I... Um, I had to get out of my opera that I was in. I was premiering an opera at that point and had to leave that all behind. And And I ended up in my theory professor's office. He was a very kind, kind person. And I just cried to him and I said, what am I going to do? This is what I've wanted to do since I was seven years old. And he said, well, why don't you take, um, I was on voice rest. Why don't you take some advanced theory classes, become a tutor and um, I'll teach you an independent study in theory pedagogy and we'll look at textbooks and you know, things like that. And there was one night I was tutoring this uh, freshman. I remember it very distinctly. Her name was Susanna. And I was so excited about what I was teaching her that I didn't take the time to erase the board 
um, I raised the board with my hands. So that night I went back to my dorm room and I had um, marker all over my hand from where I erased it. And that truly was my moment where I was like, you know, I'm really, really enjoying this. I like those light bulb moments. I like being able to apply what I know about performance to theory, which is what was particularly helped this student. So that was the moment. And I shocked everybody because everyone expected me to go into vocal health. And I just stood on the stage at my alma mater and announced I was going into theory. So that's how I got into it. And then when I went for my master's degree, I wasn't really sure what area I wanted to go into. And um, it was at the University of Tennessee. And my professors there just got me really involved in pedagogy and technology and designing computer software and, and things of that nature. So that's how I got to where I am. I've always had an interest in, in pedagogy because that's what transformed me to come into the field of music theory. That's really great. It's inspiring. Yeah, for sure. So you have recently written a book on music theory pedagogy. We're all very excited about it. It comes out soon, right? But it's out now. It's it just out. came okay. out. It's, people are just starting to get it. So I to got my it. copy about a month ago, but it's just coming out now. That's great. So what inspired you to write that book? Well, to be honest, it was about the CMS Manifesto. So if, if you don't mm -hmm. know what that CMS Manifesto was, it's a document from 2015 that came out from the College Music Society about different ways of you know, integration and diversity and things of that nature. So what happened was, I'm not sure if many people know this, but I was actually vice president of the College Music Society at that point um, for the entire organization. So I was able to see that document about 24 hours before it was released. And I knew immediately there would be some problems, especially from the music theory standpoint, because um, it just made some generalizations about some of the things we're doing. And I remember reading it as a theorist and a, and a beloved member of that society. I, I do care about that society. Um, and I remember reading it going, but that's not what I do. I don't teach Bach chorales all day. And I, you know, I do do a bunch of creative composition beyond part writing. And, and so it really got me thinking um, at that point, like, what do we know what each other's doing? And so I did a survey for SMT um, that was in 2015, in 2015, that about what theory professors are doing. And, you know, I was hoping for 50 responses and I had over 300. So that survey became the basis for a presentation at SMT and I, in 2015. And that survey, you know, made me realize what everybody's doing. And I thought I was done and I published it and everything was great. Well, then I had decided that year um, that I was going to leave the field, to be honest, and go into administration. And it was just, I had prepped for it. I had, you know, at my university, I had, you know, gone to every training and I was preparing to be an administrator. So I got a, I got a job offer for a chair position in Nashville and I love Nashville and I was going to leave. And um, I had a dream. This sounds so cheesy, but I literally had a dream about what would it be like if I wrote a book like Ken Bain's What the Best College Teachers Do? So if you're not familiar with that book, that's an excellent book. So uh, I was like, what if I traveled around the country like he did? And what if I wrote up what people were actually doing beyond this survey, not just survey, but actually going into the classroom and talking about the environment? And so um, the contract was for the, for the chair position was sitting on my desk. And I walked out on the stage at our like student recital thing. And I looked out at that audience of my, you know, we have 500 majors at Appalachian. And I was like, I'm not done teaching undergrads. I'm just not done. I, I know I'm not done. So I went to my dean, Bill Pelto, and I said, um, Bill, I, I think I'm going to stay. And he said, well, what do you want? What, what do you want to stay? And I said, I want 8 a.m. freshmen. And he's like, why? And I said, I need to get back to what <laughs> made me fall in love with the field, right? So I yeah. said, I'm an 8 a freshman and I want to write this book and I'm going to need support to travel. And so that's how the book came to be. It was, it's, it was a couple of year process from the manifesto, doing those surveys, having that epiphany moment, like I need to get in these classrooms and see what these people are doing and tell their stories. And then um, getting back in my classroom that I love and not going into administration. It just wasn't the right time. And that's how the book came to be. That was a long story, but that's the truth. No, that's great. Thank you. 
I have to say, Johnny, reading just the beginning of your book, it was so impressive, the list of names and how diversified you made it, like starting in the high schools and community college and then dividing even four-year institutions with all kinds of just gender mixes. And it was just such a great diversity. I just had so much respect for your process during that whole time. Uh, so, yeah, really big shout out for that. Thanks. And that was very, very intentional. So if you read the preface, um, it talks about that I, it was important to me to realize what was happening in those high schools as well, because I talk about that in one of the chapters that at the maximum, there's 90 days that separate those students from my freshman 8 a.m. theory classes. And so I, I learned so much from those high school teachers. First of all, they were delighted that I came in. They just were so excited. Come in, come in as much as you can. Wanted me to be there. I'll admit that there were people that I contacted that would not let me in their classroom on the college level, which I thought to be very, very interesting. But um, <laughs> when I went through, we, we looked at people that had presented at pedagogy conferences, who had presented on pedagogical topics at SMT, also who had won teaching awards. We did an exhaustive search throughout the country of who've won, who has won a teaching award at their institution. Um, it was important for me to be, to go to some of the schools where you know, those people were teaching six, seven classes a semester. They can't come to SMT or the pedagogy conferences because they're so busy teaching. So I'm excited to tell their stories. So it was very, very intentional to um, choose people in some ways that no one knows. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, and so as you've traveling across the country, uh, 17 states, um, you know, what were some of the common threads that you found between these, some of these teachers, you know, spread all over the country? What were some of those common things you began to see and spot in these teachers? I, there's, there's so many, and I, I, I tried to summarize that at the end of the book, but one of the things... Well, two, let me pick two. two. First of all, they love music. One of the coolest things I watched every teacher was when they would play music, whether it was a recording or they would be playing on the piano or singing along or even just improvising. It's almost like I could watch them close their eyes and enjoy the moment. I literally saw teachers um, on all levels go to the side of the room while a recording was playing and put their head against the wall and close their eyes like just immersed in the music because they loved it so much. So it was so genuine to watch that love of musical sound. Um, that's not something, I mean, I think we know that, but mm -hmm. to sit in the back and watch that and you're not worried about content, you're just watching the effective teacher's actions. That, that was very continuous throughout my observations. The other thing I loved um, that I saw was the art of questioning. Most of these effective teachers would would set out a question to the students, and if they didn't get a response, first of all, they're great at giving them time, but if they didn't get a response, they would they would question, keep questioning in such a manner that the student would come to the response on their own. Um, it might be a series of twelve questions, and it, and when I would share it with the instructors, they would go, "I I did that." I'm like, "You did that." It's just it's just little questions to help students to realize you know, the outcome or whatever it would be. So the art of questioning um, without just giving answers was everywhere. And high school teachers are amazing at multitasking. It was insane to watch, you know, the speaker be calling, the principal be calling, they're planning a trip to Iceland at the same time she's teaching vocabulary <laughs> and then she's playing the piano at the same time while she's answering email. It was amazing. So shout out to the high school teachers. Yeah, and as far as the high school teachers that you observed, what were um, some of them were band teachers, mm -hmm. choir teachers, orchestra? Uh, was there one area that you found that um, they kind of specifically came from, or was it a general mix as far as you know they were maybe the choir director or the assistant orchestra director, and they also teach theory? That was it. I chose the high school teachers based on um, the quarter quarter finalists from the Grammy Music Educator Award. So I took that list, which is about 200 every year. I took that list and then I did a search on everyone that taught music theory. And then I sent them that initial survey and like I sent it out to 135 and based on their responses, that's how I came up with mm -hmm. who I would visit. So um, 
Yeah, they just, that's how I found those high school teachers. And most of them, they're just teaching one or two theory classes with the exception of a Carisado that I think teaches seven a day. In Plano, Texas, they have seven AP theory classes a day at that school. It truly is. Everything is bigger, even AP yes, theory. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's right. I have to say yes. the Plano graduates that I've gotten up at North Texas have been truly fantastic in their base level of theory knowledge. It's it's very impressive. They're they're doing something right down there for sure. I'm so glad you included them. Yes, yes. So if you can read their story about what they did the day I was visiting with Michael Jackson and then dictation, it's different than what we traditionally have done in a in a college level classroom. So I hope people read that section of what Kira is doing and going, well maybe maybe multiple plays for dictation is is okay. Mm. Yeah. What were the surprises as you visited all these classrooms? How, in, in, well, I'll start with the high school. And in, in the high school teachers, how they're able to do so much with so little. I went into mm-hmm. classrooms where, you know, the, the lights are fading and flickering. The ceiling tiles look awful. You know, they barely have very few books. And they're able to just have, you know, a little uh, individual dry erase board, you know, with the staff lines. Mm-hmm. And it looks like 100 people have drawn on it. But that's what the students are using, and it's super effective. And they would hold up those dry erase boards with so much pride showing their answers. I think for the high school teachers, what surprised me is how they're able to do so much, but also how much they get done in 50 minutes. It's pretty remarkable. Um, Every 10 minutes, they're changing something. They're doing sightseeing, and then they're doing improv, and then they're doing written theory, and then they're answering terminology. And um, I think that's what surprised me about the high school teachers and all the things we can learn from them. They know a lot about technology too. They're really great at it. I guess for the college teachers, what surprised me the most is how, how, well, it didn't really surprise me though, Jen, how engaging they are. Just it's, it's, they're walking around the room. There's not many people just standing there and giving information. They're walking around the room. They're collaborating. They're putting students into teams. There, there's a lot more improvisation than I ever thought was happening even based on the survey I did back for SMT, there's so much improv and, you know, getting away from the score and creation and songwriting and, and things of that nature and just diversity of music. I mean, I kind of knew it from the survey, but, you know, when you would watch everything from, you know, your typical Chopin piano sonata and then it moves into hip hop and then it goes back to musical theater, you know, all in one class, it's it's pretty remarkable. I kind of knew it was there, but it's it's nice to know that you can actually write it out and say this is happening. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I used to do this thing on Facebook where the first day of teaching, I would post a picture of any composers or artists that I had featured. And the one time I think it was like Bruno Mars and Schumann and then like Justin Bieber or something. And I just had this picture and people were commenting on it about how, how would you possibly go about doing this one class period? I said, well, it's actually not that hard. Right. to integrate, you know, any kinds of different artists together and even into one lesson. It's it's really fun. And I think the students really buy into it um, a lot. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I agree. And that kind of leads to one of the things I noticed uh, or found really interesting in the book was how you talked about that first day of class. Mm-hmm. You know, Ben, you talked about you know, the music that you bring in that first day and kind of um, controlling that entry point into into the topic and that could be that first day um or you know uh when, whenever you're presenting a new topic to the to the studio the students um, can you talk a little bit about why that's so important that first day or that first contact um, and then my second question would be how is that going to look different if we're all online <laughs> uh, yeah i you know i always say my performance degree has really helped me You know, because it has taught me how to, I don't ever regret my performance degree. Even though my voice gave out, it it taught me how to walk into the room. I prepare my voice and my teaching very similar to how I did as a, as a performer. I think you have just a, just a few minutes to make that impression of, okay, this is going to be a class I want to be involved in. So to have that dynamic to where the first day you don't want to just sit and here's the syllabus, everybody get music making or music listening from that very first moment, because so many students have heard horror stories that music theory has made them quit loving music, you know, and they're not able to do that. So starting with some sort of 
of listening or musical making activity is incredibly important to get students involved from day one. Um, and I get some ideas on how to do that. I also think the cards that I talk about are ways that I'm sure we could do that online and I'll mention that in a second to know what music they're listening to. But to be honest, like I don't know this. And so for the next week, I'm going to take the time and go and listen to all of your music and do whatever I can to integrate it into this classroom at some point. It means so much to these students that some have just been told what to listen to or what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And for you to go, you know, your thoughts and your interests matter here too. Um, I think that really sets the tone that there's a respect between both of us um, and students just really, really live with that. Like you respected me and you wanted to hear what I had to say. So when you start getting into the point where you want them to be independent thinkers and you want them to share their opinions, they feel safe doing that in your class. If you start that message from the very first day, like you matter. Right. I was reading a blog post or something about um, getting rid of this idea of like guilty pleasure music. Like there's this mm -hmm. music that we're supposed to be studying, but then this music that, you know, we listen to when we want, like there doesn't need to be that distinction. And a I think absolutely not. expressing that to the students as well about their own music. And I think one of the, going to your second question about online, what I'm going to do this semester, I'm a hundred percent online for the fall. Um, for many, many reasons, but one, my classroom needed to be used for our little tiny, small ensembles that we're doing. So I'm using Flipgrid. I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with Flipgrid, yeah. but every student has to introduce themselves on Flipgrid. Tell me what their career goals are. Cause I always love to tell my story. Like I'm here to make musicians, not just vocalists. Look what happened to me. Thank God that I knew how to do a lot of things. But um, I asked them about their career goals, but I also asked them their favorite artist, their favorite band. But what was the moment um, in some of my upper classes, what was the moment that made you fall in love with music? I think we all know that. And in a flip grid, I'll ask them to share that. And that that is one of a one of the more pivotal moments in some of my classes is is they remember back to that high school moment or maybe even younger when they fell in love with it and when they're having those moments that they're like i want to give up i say go back and read well read what you wrote or in this case go go listen to what you said back then mm. yeah i think that's great i was using flipgrid this summer and in the spring and i found it really helpful because it's a different kind of literacy that the students can can develop not just writing things but speaking it and having the other students hear it and uh, I'm hoping to use more of that this this fall as well. Me too. Online. Yeah, that's really good. <clears throat> so Appalachian State, where you teach, has a really big industry program. So how does that experience influence your pedagogy and other things? I also teach at a school with a large music business program. So um, I know that that has influenced my pedagogy a lot across the last seven years. So I'm wondering... How has that influenced you? Well, to be honest, I think that's probably one of my biggest influences has changed who I am as a teacher is teaching the, we call them MIS, music industry studies majors. So when I came to Appalachian, um, I was asked to teach the, the course. It was called at that point, basic musicianship one and basic musicianship two for industry majors. So right there, there was a problem because mm -hmm. that title of that course makes them the other in our department. So you got music one, theory, theory one through five and then basic musicianship. So nobody wanted to be there. And I'll admit that I always tell this story for six, the first six years I taught that course poorly. I kind of taught it like a classical class and sometimes I would bring in some eagles and thought I was cool or something. So um, that didn't work. So I begged my dean, my then dean, to let me out of this course, and he said, no. <laughs> and he said, you got to figure it out. You're the only one that can do it. So I took my first sabbatical. I don't remember that. It was probably 10 years ago. I took a sabbatical, and I went, and I literally lived in the studios in Nashville. And I went and talked to all the people in L.A., and I went up to New York, and I just kind of lived in their world, mostly in Nashville because a lot of my students end up in Nashville, but I did right. bring in the L.A. and Atlanta and New York piece as well, but I didn't, I didn't like, live there. So I started to realize that um, their language was a little bit different. What they needed as a studio engineer, most of our students are music management or engineers. 
what they needed was not what I was teaching. So they needed um, great communication skills, all the basics, lead sheets, Nashville number system is like huge. Um, they needed lots of that, lots of writing, lots of transposition, lots of knowing, um, basic chord structure, not how to part write, not how to do huge analysis, analyses of, you know, a Schumann form, not so important. I was teaching sonata form in that class, not so important. So what I did was I, based on that experience of that semester of living away from Boone, I came back to school and I had written a chapter um, on Billy Joel. And I said, scratch everything in your syllabus. We're going to, we're going to learn about Billy Joel, what he did for the industry, the way he writes, we're going to write in the style of Billy Joel. We're going to learn about his marketing, all that stuff. But by the way, we're also going to kind of learn secondary dominance in the middle of it. So just, you know, <laughs> deal with that for a second. And they loved it. So I started with a YouTube channel, just a Billy Joel hits. And we started talking about them. Next thing you know, we're analyzing the pieces. They're like, whoa, that's really cool. Look at that, how that's a five of that. And you know, and it kind of snuck it in there. And then I did the ear training with it. And next thing I know, I started adding more bands and that's how contemporary musicianship came to be. And that's another book that I have. And it just, it's changed everything. So I approach it from an artist that they, and they're the ones that give me the artist name. Again, I ask my students, who, who are some artists from the past that you really, really respect? So back when the first edition came out, it was Rascal Flatts. They loved Rascal Flatts. And so Rascal Flatts for the second edition has been replaced by Bruno Mars. So all Bruno Mars, his writing style, his history, his background. Oh, by the way, here's some mode mixture. So, and then we do composition with it. So I think teaching the industry students, they have this, oh my gosh, they, are, they don't care about grades. And I would say this to their face. They do not care. They want to know what do they need to do to be successful in the studio. So at the end of those chapters or in my class, I invite engineers and music managers to come and, and zoom in and talk to my students about how theory has helped them to be better at XYZ. So um, with public music theory, with their Danny Jenkins is doing some work and I'm working on something with Pat McMakin, who is the main engineer at Ocean Way in Nashville about yeah. how music theory is used in the studio. We're working on that right now. And many, many engineers have music degrees, which is wonderful, but they'll tell you right now what they use the most is transposition, hearing timbres, um, and you know, basic chord changes and how to read a Nashville chart and how to change it really quick for sound. So, that's, how, that's what's happened for me with the industry majors is that I've learned to never be set in one way. I have to keep track of what's happening in the industry. Like video game music is huge right now in the studios in Nashville. They're recording video yes. game music, which is awesome. But so that's something that I'm integrating more and more of is video game music because I can see that that might be where my students end up. So I can never rest on my laurels with my industry majors. That's so great. And I've, I've looked at that book quite a bit. Um, occasionally, I confess, stolen some of your examples because <laughs> the students do connect to them. I was just uh, telling the guys that we did one of the queen examples with modulations, and that was the student's favorite day. It's so fun to put on music and look out and they're all like, you know, bobbing their heads yeah. and, you know, moving mm -hmm. along. And sometimes they do that with Beethoven, but um, more so with <laughs> Queen, I think. So <laughs> Absolutely. And I think there's a, in the second edition, which comes out next week, I'm not trying to plug, but it really is. Um, there's a whole chapter on Dolly Parton and I'm a major Dolly Parton fan. And so when I got to talk to her manager, I mean, I was like a fangirl. Like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm like one step away from Dolly. And, um, but, but the <laughs> students love her. I mean, for her, for her, you know, her personal input to, to the community and everything she's done for the community and the music world. Her songs are pretty simple. It's great to introduce triads mm -hmm. with Dolly Parton. It's great. But, but it's not just the music that my industry majors, they fall in love with these artists. So when I put Jacqueline to pray, there's a whole chapter on Jacqueline. They're in awe of her. 
we watch the performances. There's a YouTube channel. And, and by the time I teach Neapolitan chords, they're like, man, did you see how she like leaned into that? And I'm like, yeah, that's where it's at. And they're like, oh, I need to do that on my guitar. And so it's, <laughs> it's a really, that class, I think sometimes, like I teach the traditional classes too. And I wish my traditional majors would take as many uh, just chances that Risks. my industry yeah. majors mm-hmm. do. Because yeah. anything I teach, they're like grabbing their guitar or grabbing their keyboard. Like, what if I did this? What if I did this? And yes. my other majors sometimes can be like, is this going to be on the test? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Or they're aiming for perfection or for right. a particular goal because the, you know, the traditional music majors, which is what we call them where I teach, um, so often they're working from a fixed score. Right. Um, I teach a jazz theory class, and one of the things I love is that we, we never look at a fixed score that entire semester. They're always working from a lead sheet or maybe even just a collection of chord symbols, and it changes the way that they interact with the music. So I brought a lot more of that into my traditional classroom as well. Yeah, and Jen, I was so fortunate to come and watch Jen teach for the Teaching Music Theory text. And and one thing that's really cool about your class, Jen, is when you they are looking at those stripped down scores with just lead sheets, mm-hmm. you can almost see them hearing it in their head, you know, because yes. they're like, okay, all right, and this habit, okay. And I just, I love to watch that. I love to watch them making the connections on their own. Me too. I can't remember if we did it that day, but sometimes I even make them solfege bass lines and things like that along with the lead sheets so that they have to be connecting with it musically. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the interesting things at the beginning of that jazz class is the first few times I hand them a lead sheet, many of them have trouble following it. We have to actually kind of learn that skill for the students in the classroom who are more classically leaning or who have worked mostly with fully written out scores. They're sort of struggling that first time, especially if it's fast or if it, you know, if it moves quickly, they might be like, where, where are we? When we do a bebop tune, for example, they're like, oh, oh no, you know, so you have to kind of help them learn how to read it. But then pretty quickly, they, they connect to it in a different way, I think. And it's very cool. Yeah, I was going to tag on one thing about the video game music that you mentioned. I had, I had supervised a thesis on video game music, and I'm by no means an expert in that area. But the more I delved into it, the more excited I got and the more I integrated the examples into class. And then in my theory three, what I did is I actually took a video game trailer. So I took a two to three minute video game trailer that was not a super obscure game, but maybe obscure enough that people don't already know the theme song. Mm -hmm. Took out the music and then I gave it to my class and I said, write the theme. What does this sound like to you? I was so amazed by the results. Some of those I thought were better than the actual game theme, which I did play for them after they wrote their own. But it was so cool to compare that and see what they came up with just looking at the imagery of the game and kind of the narrative of that little little game trailer. It was, it was so fascinating, uh, the results of that. Yeah, and I think we're going to have more and more students coming, you know, with that kind of background, that that's the music that they listen to. I mean, I have a nine-year-old daughter, and... And let's see. And she always is asking Alexa to play, play songs from, oh my goodness. Let's see, like in, I can't even remember. Play song, it's from a video game. And mm-hmm. she'll ask Alexa to play that for her. So I just think there, there is something to be said for all the different types of music that are, are being produced in these studios that our students are going to be coming in already knowing. So thanks for sharing that, Ben. It's really great. Well, Jenny, I think we could talk for another five hours, but we <laughs> promised you that this would only be about a 30 minute interview. Oh. <laughs> Time has flown, but we do have some rapid fire questions for you. All right. Okay. So these have been, these questions have been um, in an encrypted server that's never been seen by you. And um, these are just going to be short little questions. Um, you don't have to give any explanations for why you think that, uh, but just these little little sound bites. So the first one, I'm going to ask you the first one. Um, this is an uh, 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 or question. So 164 or 564? CAD 64. I don't write one or five. All right. I like that. Outside the box. Very good. <laughs> nice. Okay, I'm up. What one composer would you add to the canon? <laughs> These are not easy. They're just rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Any musical theater. 
Mm. I can't pick one right now. Any anything from musical theater? Yeah, in the yeah, past they're twenty five years. Yeah, they're often underrated, mm-hmm. but doing really tremendous work. Ben, you're up. I totally agree. All right, my question is minor law versus minor dough. Minor dough. <laughs> I think we all do minor dough on yeah. this call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to get much. So we won't argument. have a throw down on that today. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, read, read chapter, whatever chapter that is. I talk about it. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, well, it was interesting uh, kind of how diverse the that you found their minor law, minor dough numbers, um, yeah. and some of the some others, which I was intrigued by, too. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, kind of as we're coming to the end, um, kind of just want to close with just asking you kind of what other projects you already mentioned, uh, projects that you're working on now, but kind of things that you're working on in the future and, you know, any ways that um, our listeners could um, um, uh, find out more about your work or how to contact you. Sure. I think the, um, I think one of the things I'm most interested in right now is in public music theory for sure in getting ideas outside of academia. So that's why I'm working with the engineers on this new chapter for the public music theory handbook with Oxford. So that should be out soon. I I really, I went with Danny Jenkins last year to a maximum security prison and taught some theory uh, and concepts there with him one day. And I think that might be there and in the public school system working, working to take some of the things I've learned out. So whether it's in a prison, whether it's in the elementary classroom, wherever, getting out of my office and getting out into the real quote, you can't see me, but quote real world. (laughs) Um, that's, that's imperative for me to continue growth. So I would just encourage any theory professors out there listening or any faculty on for that for that point to to go out and leave your offices when we can when it's safe it's not safe right now but to go out and spend some time one of the best things i did this year is i volunteered as the uh vocal coach and music coordinator for a k-8 through musical here in town and i learned so much i learned so much so i just think that is where i'm headed into more public music theory i i don't think i'm going to be an administrator anytime soon I'm really happy we started the app. We started a new graduate certificate in theory, pedagogy, and research that starts in two weeks. We have five new students. So I'm really, really interested in just mentoring the next field of -of out-of-the-box thinkers that um, want to make an impact. So that's where I'm headed. Yeah, that Danny Jenkins keynote from the pedagogy conference a couple years ago was just amazing. Inspiring. Yeah, inspiring. Absolutely. That's Mm -hmm. great. And so where can people um, find you online? (laughs) Well, you know, you can find me on all the usual places. Um, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook and feel free to, you know, join me there. I also have a blog that goes along with the book called Bridging the Music Theory Gap. And there's a lot of contributors on that. And so we're trying to have multiple contributors um, throughout the semester. Um, Always feel free to email me. I'm at Appalachian State. This is my 16th year, so I'm pretty settled here. Snodgrassjs at appstate.edu. Or just come visit the beautiful mountains of Boone, North Carolina. So that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to Note Doctors, the music theory and pedagogy podcast. We will be back with more interviews with professors and teachers who will be dropping all sorts of theory knowledge for your education, edification, and enjoyment. So until then, bye-bye.